Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at podcast one at gmail.com. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this PATC podcast. My name is Mark Waterfill. I am the president and owner of Public Agency Training Council, the largest and longest running provider of seminars and education for law enforcement, fire officials, uh, school teachers, school administrators, and similar public officials. We really appreciate you listening to our PATC podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Dave Broadway. Good afternoon. Um, I've had the pleasure of being associated with PATC for about eight years. A little brief on myself. I'm 34 years retired law enforcement, and I've been adjuncting at colleges and uh, doing some training on the side for the last 20-ish years. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we've got a great guest uh, with us uh, today, Bob Schaefer. Bob has been a longtime uh, instructor for PATC. Bob, uh, give our audience a little bit about your background. So, hey, it's really great to be here. I appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, my background is I've been with the uh, Loveland Police Department in Loveland, Colorado for 36 years and 10 months, and uh, uh, soon to be done. I taught for uh, PATC since 2009, and um, uh, it's been a great experience. So right now I'm the uh, lieutenant over the, cr- the criminal investigation unit. What is the class that you teach? I teach investigating statement analysis. Uh, you also have a side gig as well. Don't we see you occasionally on uh, national media? Yeah, that's right. So I'm associated um, with the uh, with a group uh, out of Florida, and we um, offer our services uh, to examine uh, what's sort of informational evidence in uh, criminal investigations. So uh, as a result of that, I end up once in a while on court TV, some other crime related television shows on cable. I've seen you on Court TV. Tell our audience some of the major cases that you've been an analyst for. So one of them was, I don't know how important of a case it was, but it was the court proceedings between uh, Johnny Depp and Amber, uh, what was her name? Heard. Heard. Yeah, and analyzing the language in their testimonies to see who's uh, being deceptive and who might be telling the truth. And then uh, the last big one that I did um, uh, that had some national significance was um, the case with uh, Brian Landry, and uh, who was um, suspected of, and I think you know, they now killed uh, his girlfriend as they were traveling across the United States, a young couple. Uh-huh. And um, so, uh-huh. yeah, it was an interesting case because they, uh, well, that was one of the questions, was uh, they found a diary, what appeared to be a diary, and it had an explanation of what happened during this uh, her death. And there's questions as to whether or not he actually wrote the entries in the diary or whether somebody else. And um, taking it a step further, it was was the content of that those diary entries were they were they truthful or were they fabricated? Some dual dual investigation. Did he write it or not? And is what was written there true? So uh, that was a big one. Really interesting. Uh, I bet. Who do you appear with on that show? That one was uh, Sina Wang. Uh, she's a body language. Uh, I'm sorry, no, she's a handwriting analyst. And uh, where she analyzes handwriting style, you know, how you loop your L's and cross your T's and slant your letters and all that stuff. I look at, uh, I examine content. I look at what a person said, mm-hmm. how they put their story together, and can determine whether or not that story came out of memory or whether it was affected by some other source, i.e. manipulated, deceptive. So we had a, a couple different uh, perspectives on some. Yeah, Bob, I have a quick question for you. Being in the law enforcement fraternity myself, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, what I love to do is to kind of get into people's heads when I'm trying to recruit them as confidential sources. Bob, do you ever deal within your classes like cultural and regional phraseology as you're as you're looking into someone? Because here in the mountains, I've seen so much. There's so many oddities. I retired to the mountains to understand yeah, yeah. some of the locals and what they really meant or their core value. The basis or one of the fundamental premises of my class is that, of pe- that the way people, I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word lie, but that's not really the most accurate word. It's they're deceptive. They mislead people. It's hardwired into the human brain. So it doesn't matter whether you're from Argentina or Alaska or Russia or China or the United States. It doesn't matter. The way people lie, it, it, there's, a, there's a, a format for that. There's a template in your brain. And everybody basically lies the same way. They use the same strategies. Now, their language might be a little bit different, obviously, uh, but it, it crosses language barriers. It doesn't matter. I've taught this class in um, Arabic, in Spanish, 
and um, obviously English, and um, I've had some translation stuff uh, that I was doing in Russian, and um, I've traveled around the world, uh, Chinese, and, then, and uh, the concepts are all the same. So yeah, there are some regional dialects, but it's really easy to figure out how those fit into the form. So it really does come in. Everybody lies the same way, and even it, it even applies to sign language. It's content. It's not what language <laughs> you speak. It's it, You can lie in sign language, too, and, and so... Would you liken it, Bob, to like um, uh, microfacial expressions or worldwide? And uh, if, if you look surprised, you look surprised in Uganda is the same as you do in uh, Florida. Uh, do you look at it kind of like that? I mean, I don't look at those things. Obviously, I look at the content of a person's story, but it, it, it's along the same lines, which is, again, it's a human nature. It's hardwired in the human brain how people deceive. And so uh, micro expressions and, um, you know, I'm not a body language expert, so, so I can't really attest to that. But I suspect that the majority of analyzing body language, those concepts probably apply. So, yeah, in that sense, it's looking at the way a hu- what I look at is the way a person takes in information, how they if they're the let's put this way, if they're the um, they witness somehow a crime, whether they're a witness to it, victim or a suspect, they experience that and they take that information, they store it in their memory. And it, it, it's the way it comes out that matters. The uh, a truthful person just recalls that memory. They visualize it and they, they say or they write down what they remember. A uh, deceptive person takes that same memory and they alter it, modify it, they manipulate it to serve their purpose. So a deceptive person might, say, committed a homicide, might take that event and twist it just enough to make it look like it was self-defense or it was an accident. And so they base it in that memory, but they just manipulate the memory a little bit to serve their purpose. And we can tell that based on the language that they use and the structure of their story and things like that. And these are all elements that you bring out in your class? The answer is yes to that. But to take it a step further, the, um, it's one thing to know whether somebody's lying or not. Anybody can know that. You can have that gut feeling that somebody's lying. What I do is take that gut feeling and turn it into knowledge, meaning we know why you have that gut feeling. What makes me feel that way? It's because, well, I use the same strategies when I lie. You use the same strategies when you lie. Not can say, you know, say you guys lie, but uh, everybody lies. Let's face it. So you can create, it creates a gut feeling that something's not right. That's because those are those strategies are familiar to you. And I take that and bring it out as to this is why it sounds familiar, why you have that suspicion. But I take it a step further. It's one thing to know if somebody's lying. It's another, how do you use that and take it the next step, which is compel a confession or gain more information. And so um, that's what I do is take that that analysis, find out what part of their story is deceptive, and then teach people how to use the, the subject's memory against them, how to you cause a conflict in that, that deceptive person. Their memory says one thing, which is true. It, your, their memory room well, knows what happened. Their conscious mind says, you can't say that. That's a confession. So we amplify that that conflict in their brain and use that against them to co- compel a confession. The subconscious brain always wants to tell the truth. It wants to tell what it knows. It's the conscious mind that says, no, you can't do that. So there's a conflict there. We can take advantage of that conflict in an interview setting. I really like that answer. Thanks, Bob. So how did you get into this topic? Uh, back in 1995, my captain at the time said, hey, Bob, I, I've become aware of this class, and it's taught by a guy, and I'll give him credit for it. His name is Abinoma Sapir. He's known worldwide as the uh, guru of uh, statement analysis, and I took, I took a class from him, and I was so interested in it, but I ended up taking multiple classes in it and went through advanced training and one-on-one mentoring with him for years and ended up teaching for him, and then uh, parted ways. Uh, that's kind of the way things happen sometimes. It just Our interests uh, went different directions, and, I, and then a couple of years later, somebody said, you know, you're really good at this. You should consider teaching it. So I incorporated his information along with uh, a lot of other information I've gotten from other different trainings. And there's a lot of agencies like the FBI has done quite a bit of research and statement analysis. And, and um, the thing is, I've taught a lot of FBI agents statement analysis. I've taught at the uh, NCIS Academy and their headquarters. The FBI taught at the um, Mexican equivalent to our, our NSA and their, their CIA. So I've taught at three high level. Um, and um, the same in uh, United Arab Emirates. I went over there and taught a class so uh that are high level um, intelligence inter, uh, officers. And so, um, so yeah, it just it started out where I t- took a class. I got really good at it based on what my instructor said. And uh, But the, the proof of that comes with, it's kind of empirical, which is if I, it turns out that what I come up with is is an accurate representation of what happened. So if the, pr- you know, the proof is in is in, in the result. And, um, and so what I teach and what I do 
is not just, it's not guesswork. It's based on good research, good science. And um, so I took what I learned in class and expanded on that. I actually do quite a bit of outside uh, work for uh, police agencies. I've got a, a handful of uh, statements and interview transcripts I'm analyzing right now for different agencies. Around oh, I see. So. So there is something about color coding the statements. Is that, am I correct with that? Yeah. So if I um, probably need to get my website updated a little bit, but there's some examples on there. When I get a, a statement that can be an audio tape or it could be a handwritten statement, I transcribe that into a typed version. This makes it easier to deal with. And one, one of the ways that I, well, let me put it this way. I treat a statement like the crime scene. It's a crime scene on eight and a half by 11 inch mm-hmm. page. And like any other crime scene, when you walk into that crime scene, you search it in a systematic way. And when you find a piece of evidence, you you know, you, you put a little tent next to it with a number on it, you photograph it, you log it, and then you collect it. We do the same thing on a piece of paper. It's just that it's done with visual aids, meaning um, certain a certain element of language that I'll be interested in has a certain color assigned to it. So I'll highlight those words with a certain color. And then uh, other elements that we look for, for different reasons, have different colors assigned to them. So as we find our language evidence, uh, I, I, I log it. And, and it, color coding makes it easy to look at a page and know what type of um, language evidence I found there, what it means so it's it's basically documenting a search pattern is really what it is so if you go into a room there's been a homicide and there's all these little tents and there's evidence you look at it you see all these things scattered around well the same thing it's just on a piece of paper so it's a way of logging and cataloging and remembering where this language evidence is Bob, one thing I was I was curious about as you were talking was clusters. Are you looking for clusters of behaviors? Because I love what you're saying about conflict within your conscious and unconscious mind, like a moral conflict, a spiritual conflict, or a cultural conflict. And are you looking for more than one down here to say, maybe I slipped one time and, and I was inaccurate, but now I'm I'm on a roll. Yes, that's absolutely right. And I think you'd find that's true with uh, any discipline that claims to be able to detect deception it, it, as, as the, your brain, as it's, as it's visualizing or it's recalling from memory and it gets to the place where it knows it needs to deceive the reader or the listener, then all these different te- tactics or strategies for deception percolate to the surface. And so um, the, the truthful parts of a statement uh, will have virtually nothing there to identify, nothing to, to, to log. As we get closer and into the, the deceptive part of the story, we'll see multiple occurrences of sometimes the same language strategy, and sometimes there'll be a mixture of them. And that's one thing that Mark was talking about, the color coding. We we log our evidence on that page in the margin, and you can see where the clusters of, of these um, language evidence uh, occurrences appear. And so it's, that's absolutely right, is that we look for clusters, concentrations of, uh, of deceptive thought. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's almost not fair um, to get a statement and analyze it. And I, whenever I get one, I get excited because it's, I know I'm going to catch this. When I say catch them, it's like I catch them in the lie. Then it's up to the detective to apply a good interview strategy to use that. That's great, Bob. You're a fantastic instructor, and we thoroughly enjoy our relationship with you. And you said now you're getting ready to retire. How many years uh, have you been a police officer? Yeah, so I started July 21st, 1980s. Most of my uh, detectives, I could be their grand. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's about time that, you know, I, I hang that up. Um, police work has gotten, yeah, it's gotten complicated. It's gotten frustrating in some in some cases. And, uh, yeah, it's not like it was in the old days. And um, But with that said, this technique that I'm talking about, statement analysis technique, is one of those things that it's timeless. It doesn't change. And it's one of those things that I teach my guys and, and um so, you know, this is one of those things that you can use no matter how much technology you have and no matter what laws you have to battle against, no matter how many attorneys are involved in this case, um, you can get to the truth. Right, right. And, uh, and so uh, it's very satisfying. That's fantastic. Uh, Bob, we thoroughly enjoy having you as an instructor. You're an excellent instructor. Uh, I've been to Bob's house out in Loveland, Colorado, and it's an absolutely beautiful place. Are you still having the elk uh, come out in the backyard and the golf course? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. They, I'm, right now I'm repairing my yard after they've uh, eaten everything and, and uh, trampled the, the lawn and the flower beds and stuff. I know people think that, oh, those elks are awesome. And they are. But when you've dealt with them for 20 years, it's kind of like squirrels getting in your attic. <laughs> yeah, they, they've been reintroduced into North Carolina. So, yeah, I'm hearing the story. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great rest of your week. And thanks so much to our audience for listening. <laughs>